Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you joined us for this episode of Stay Curious. Behind me, I have a man who climbed a cherry tree oh, a long, long time ago, over 100 years ago, and he had a thought. And that thought has created what we now call our rocket renaissance here on the Space Coast. Of course, that is Robert Goddard over my shoulder and Marty Winkle and I, my cameraman, co-producer. We love Robert Goddard. He is one of the most underrated, unestimated, intelligent human beings uh, to walk the face of the Earth simply because he could have orbited the Earth probably with a spacecraft as early as 1930. And uh, there's a nice tribute to him. We're going to talk about Robert Goddard here in the context of... Nope, there's Carlton Bailey. Hey, Carlton, he made the big time the other uh, 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 at a Comic-Con that I helped him with. Carlton, our rocket launch photographer buddy, congratulations on getting in the Comic-Con. He is a expert on everything Godzilla. And next time we have Carlton on here, we'll talk a little Godzilla. But no, we want to start out with a cherry tree. And uh, a cherry tree figures in prominently in American history. One, our father of our country, of course, George Washington. There's that fable, some people say, where he chopped down a cherry tree and could not tell a lie about it. And then there is Robert Goddard, who in 1899, on October 19th, in uh, Massachusetts, uh, most likely where he grew up was uh, Worcester, uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, or Worcestershire, Massachusetts. Uh, he climbed a cherry tree on this date, 10 years old, and Robert Goddard had a vision. He saw a huge flying machine propelled by whirling, unequaled, horizontal, centrifugal devices, rising from a pit, headed for Mars. And although he would work on perpetual motion that he was envisioning in his mind, uh, he abandoned that I idea when, as a teenager, he discovered Newton's laws of physics. And we're going to talk a little bit about Robert Goddard today in that cherry tree. Isn't it interesting? George Washington and Robert Goddard connected to a cherry tree uh, uh, in their, their, their history. Or... Here is Goddard tinkering around on some uh, something there. I'm not sure exactly what that is. But... Uh, a, sequ a, a sequence of events may have altered history completely, uh, and it has to do with uh, man's attitude towards new things and new devices. Uh, being a, a senior citizen myself, I sometimes resist the new things, you know. Think about when the, the dot-com era started over 20 years ago, and you mailed your first email for the first time. Uh, well, the last time you dropped a roll of film off at the the uh, CVS or, or Ritz camera, you didn't realize that might be the last time you ever developed a roll of film, but it certainly probably was for most of us. Well, this man, Robert Goddard, got scorned by the press for his thoughts about that uh, man could climb on a, a rocket propelled engine and go to the planets. And uh, that was all based on the misconception of physics among, among the time there. Uh, Robert Goddard, uh, uh, towards the end of, uh, of course, famously, uh, his first flight uh, in 1914, uh, receiving patents for the the uh, Mar uh, March 20 March 16th, 1926, was the first liquid fuel rocket in his aunt Effie's backyard in Massachusetts, Auburn, Massachusetts, I believe, and we have a tribute to that out at Space View Park. Uh, and uh, did I miss the did I miss the slide of Space View Park there? Was that a uh, there's the cherry tree and no there's Carlton no Space View Park shot in there, but we do have this paver out there that is around our Mercury Monument that shows his device and the first liquid fuel rocket in 1926. Uh, uh, towards the end of 1930s. He was thinking the possibilities of, of a rocket going to the moon. And uh, the press picked up on his idea and the feasibility of such a thing. And they ridiculed him, 
creating uh, in Goddard firm convictions that he would not talk to the media and would not share his his rocket secrets with the world. Uh, and the rest of his life, he pretty much was a recluse. He had a core of people around him that launched the rockets. There are some of them there, one of his bigger rockets. He had the financial support of Charles Lindbergh, the great aviator, and the Smithsonian gave him $10,000 in 1927, but uh, which was like 100000 or 200000 in today's money. But um, by 1929, his first rockets had gimbal steering, power-driven pumps. He put uh, uh, things like a, uh, uh, a barometer on them, a camera, the first scientific payloads in uh, doing these suborbital flights. They weren't suborbital. They were a few thousand feet. And... Uh, uh, if he'd have had more money and, and more positive thinking behind him, uh, we would have been orbiting things around the Earth uh, and probably human beings in the 1940s. Uh, but Goddard died in 1945, 12 years before Sputnik. And uh, the liquid pro propellant rocket developed by, by him, uh, his main work is titled that, 1936. Uh, about nine years, well, then he died nine years later. He moved to Roswell, New Mexico. That's where this picture was taken with his uh, group of rocket uh, engineers. Like I said, char aviation hero Charles Lindbergh and the Guggenheim family gave him meager support. But he, if he'd have had the, the support of the government and uh, uh, particularly the common man, uh, we could have done great things earlier. Goddard's major accomplishments. He explored the practicality of using rocket propulsion to reach high altitudes. He proved that a rocket will work in a vacuum, that it needs no air to push against it. In fact, the New York Times made an editorial ridiculing Goddard, saying that, uh, of course, you need an atmosphere for a rocket to, to move forward because it has to have something to propulse against. And Goddard didn't think so. And then he proved that. He uh, he shot a scientific payload in orbit in 1929, used vanes on rocket motor blasts for guidance, developed gyro control apparatus for rocket flight, received a U.S. patent in 1914 for multi-stage rockets, developed pumps suitable for rocket fuels, and launched a rocket with a gyro and pivotal mo uh, gimbaled motor in 1937. The father of modern rocketry uh, was inspired as a young man with the H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds when he was sitting on that cherry tree 10 years old. Uh, Clark University in uh, uh, Massachusetts is where he uh, uh, taught and was sort of his base of operations. And um, he, uh, like I said, he could have orbited things uh, around the earth as early as the 1930s. Uh, uh, and such was the ridicule and scorn, and, and this really affected his psyche. The world lost a great opportunity in America, particularly to uh, start going into space, definitely in the 1940s. Well, having proved that he was right time and time again during the moon race, of course, with Russia in the 1960s and the Apollo 11 landing on the moon in July, uh, uh, July 20th, 1969. A few days after that landing, I think it was the day when the Apollo 11 crew got back to Earth, the New York Times published this correction, saying on January 13th, 1920, on the topics of the Times, an editorial page feature of the New York Times dismissed the notion that a rocket could function in a vacuum and commented on the ideas of Robert H. Goddard, the rocket pioneer, as follows. They really slammed him. They said that Professor Goddard, with his chair, quote, in Clark College in the countenance of the Smithsonian Institute, does not know the relation of action to reaction and of the need to have something better than a vacuum against which to react to say uh, that that would be absurd. Of course, he seems, this is Goddard, seems to lack the knowledge ladled out daily in today's high schools. And uh, so, unquote, 
Further investigation and experimentation have confirmed the findings of Isaac Newton in the 17th century and is now definitely established that a rocket can function in the vacuum as well as in an atmosphere. The Times regrets the error. And that is so uh, monumental in many ways, being a, a journalist in my youth, uh, reprinting a retraction and a correction. Wow, it was really a big deal. Uh, and usually they put it on page two or three and not on the front page. Uh, but uh, for the New York Times to uh, 60, uh, uh, well, I've been 49 years later, uh, retract their, their criticism of Robert Goddard. Had they endorsed him in 1920, had it been just the opposite, and they said, this man's a genius, you know, follow him to the ends of the earth, literally, we're going to leave the earth. Think of how different it could have been. Uh, such is human nature, huh, Marty? The the opinions and the uh, uh, and what what's one of the great quotes that he had that there that maybe I can pull out of my hat here. Yes, Goddard's quote is, and show the great man there. It is difficult to say what is impossible, for the dream of yesterday is the hope of today in the reality of tomorrow. The dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. That's what Robert Hutchins Goddard had to say about pursuing your dreams as he did. So, well, Marty, anything to add to our, our man Robert Goddard there? No, he came up also with the uh, idea of putting a nozzle on an engine. And he also had the idea of putting fins on it, which is something uh, Von Braun believed in the fins yeah he believed in the uh as we scoff at that right marty because when you look at the saturn V rocket it has fins on it and the fins serve no aerodynamic purpose whatsoever they don't interfere with anything nor do they enhance anything it was simply that uh when asking his design you know what are the fins for uh the great uh, dr von braun said a rocket ship must have fins right marty <laughs> that's right all right. Well, we're going to move on to a rocket ship that had uh, a rudder and wings and, and uh, uh, more than just fins on it. As we talk about one of our favorite astronauts as pilot of STS-34 in the mission of Atlantis on this uh, Tom Musiak photo that was taken on October 18th, 1989, 33 years ago. Hey, Tom, hope you're doing well up there in Pennsylvania. Uh uh, and the crew deployed the Jupiter-bound satellite called Galileo after the great uh, scientist and astronomer uh, who discovered the moons of Jupiter through his crude telescope in 1609. So uh, this mission was going to not uh, go to Jupiter, obviously. It was going to put the payload of the Galileo spacecraft in, or in Earth orbit and then it had its own rocket that would ignite and send it to Jupiter, which is what happened. And uh, a beautiful launch there. But because Jupiter is far away from the sun and solar panels wouldn't gather up enough energy, particularly in 1989, those type of uh, the solar panels back then were, were probably pretty crude to what we're using now 33 decades later. Uh, they had a radio uh, thermal isotope uh, energy source on there basically a radio a chunk of radioactive uh uranium that uh would create heat and that heat would be created into electrical energy uh in the spacecraft uh, called an rtg well this spacecraft being launched with it had one on it and in 1989 there was major protests that if this shuttle had blown up in the florida skies or at the launch pad that that radioactive thermal generator would uh, develop enough radioactivity to, oh, some people said take out, you know, the, the middle of the state or Orlando and so forth. And I scoff at the idea because, again, people's misconceptions of the actual facts. Well, we've got a, a, a beautiful uh, display at the American Space Museum where there's these scrapbook volumes of all of the shuttle missions put together by a shuttle fan in Michigan years ago. And when he passed away, his daughter brought these to our museum and they're fun to look at, particularly the newspapers of the day uh, in, the, in the 80s, uh, uh, the shuttle era, the early days of it, in the 90s. 
but then it tapered off and he did not too many newspaper articles in these tomes, but a lot of uh, printed out things. But so here is a look at these inside of one of these books where the Galileo actually went to a circuit judge to stop this rocket launch. And it got delayed several times by weather on there. Uh, it was rescheduled to a faulty main engine controller on the number two main engine one time. And then they had weather condition problem. His primary payload, of course, was the Galileo. Uh, most, most recaps of STS-34 don't talk about the controversy over this, but it filled the newspapers. And there's our crew inside the uh, uh, the cockpit up there. You've got Don Williams on the right above my head, Mike McCulley, the pilot. Don Williams, this was his second flight and last, and he was a commander. And uh, Mike McCulley, this was his first flight and only flight. We'll talk about Mike in a minute. Uh, Franklin Chang Diaz is there in the middle. This was his second of uh, seven flights, record setting seven with uh, Jerry Ross. Shannon Lucid, her second of uh, five flights there uh, left. And all alone in the bottom, riding it out, would have been Ellen Baker there so, uh, standing up. So she on the, the lower bay. So you had two men and three men on this historic flight. Only a five day mission. But the debate went on. The danger is too slight uh, to hold Galileo back, finally, the U.S. Uh, uh, one debate said. The debate, and then on the other hand, danger is too great. Hold Galileo's launch. And you had advocates of both of that. And Marty, you don't hear about this today in uh, space news. You don't hear anything questioning what SpaceX has on board theirs, spacecraft, or uh, uh, those type of things. I don't know if some of these um, top secret satellites being launched by United Launch Alliance don't have radioactive uh, power sources on them because they're, duh, top secret. But I uh, thought we'd look back in time th uh, three decades ago where the papers did matter. Everybody read the newspapers today, three bucks for a USA Today. And, and you're like going, gee, there's not even enough pages here for to put in the birdcage right marty <laughs> it's like eight pages uh but i digress about my opinion about uh, how our great newspapers have uh, aren't in existence anymore but this was quite a debate uh there's there's our crew again the rtg uh was simply a uh, a heat source that had all kinds of safety controls around it all right this thing was designed to uh be blasted at by a tank or whatever, and it would not uh, degrade or break. But they couldn't convince anyone. There's one of the pellets. That's what that is, Marty. That's an actual uranium, wherever they use, 247 or whatever pellet uh, that's about the size of probably a, a, a pearl and a pearl necklace. And, there, and they would go in there and then uh, through uh, uh, a mechanical operation would create electricity. So... And here is an RTG uh, similar to what was used on the moon with a lady standing there to show you the perspective of it because uh, we did uh, go to the moon in 1971 uh, and 2 with our scientific payload stations were powered by uh, radioisotopes degrading and creating energy off that heat. So here again is our, uh, our friend Mike McCulley with Ellen Brown there. And Mike, again, uh, Mike, uh, we love you. He's a great supporter of our American Space Museum. Doesn't do too many personal appearances because uh, he does a lot of private behind-the-scenes appearances that mean a lot. And I'll tell you one of them here in just a minute. Uh, there, see, protesters expand their fight to scrub NASA's Galileo mission. People actually chain themselves to the fence. Uh, out there. I'm not sure which fence, Marty, somewhere along Route 3, probably. Do you remember any of that? Do you remember that going on, Marty, in the news? Yeah, and it was State Road 3. Uh huh. And what was the public's uh, opinion about this, you think? Or was this just a small group of people? Yeah, so it was a small group. The public was okay with it. It's just that, like you said, a small group of people. They're the vocal ones. And they got a lot of attention, too. Uh, Mike McCulley doesn't remember a lot about it because he couldn't care less and he was focused on
piloting uh, Atlantis to its orbit up there to deploy this important spacecraft, which, by the way, went to Jupiter uh, about th four years later, was orbiting Jupiter, uh, gave us 12 years of fantastic science in the 1990s, and then they crashed and burned it into the uh, atmosphere of Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter, as we see it, is just a, a gigantic uh, ball of, of uh, uh, hydrogen, methane, uh, the surface of it could be a metallic hydrogen core. That's basically a failed sun is what Jupiter is. Uh, uh, an object that if it had been five times bigger, it would have collapsed and done a nuclear burn and be created a, a double star system there. So, well, here is the, uh, again, another picture, another to just emphasize what a big deal this was. Okay. Uh, workers to monitor launch radiation from cocoa and everybody become a radiation expert. And I'll bet you couldn't find a, a radiation detector within uh, three states around here, probably. People were trying to buy their own things. Uh, and there is an RTG there, uh, the silver object in the foreground. That is what powered the Apollo Lunar Science Experiment Project on the moon. And in the background there is one of the science experiments. And there again is our crew in space of STS-34. 33 years ago there, uh, Don Williams and uh, uh, Ellen Baker, and Shannon Lucid. There's Mike over on the right. And of course, uh, Franklin Chang Diaz. Uh, like I said, that was Ch Franklin's second of seven flights. So, uh, but we always, we want to, because we can, I wanted to give an opportunity to give Mike McCulley a shout out and thank him for all that he's done for our American Space Museum. And the community. He does live on the Space Coast here. He was born August 4th, 1943 in San Diego, California, but he was raised in Livingston, Tennessee, and that's his hometown. And I know for a fact that he uh, does some wonderful things for the youth behind the scenes in Livingston, Tennessee. Navy Captain McCulley uh, in this picture here shown, uh, taken by Tom Usiak. Hi, Tom. He was the uh, uh, first submariner to go to space. He served on one diesel-powered and two nuclear-powered submarines. And uh, he's a Purdue Knot, one of the two dozen proud boilermakers out of that institution. Uh, he was the first of seven pilots in his astronaut class. So Mike, on Stay Curious, an uh, interview he did a, a year back, said that uh, he was the first of seven pilots. Uh, whoever was the chief of the astronaut office told him, one, he wasn't going to be a commander, and two, he's got to rotate these other pilots in before you're going to fly again in three or four years. And Mike said he didn't want to stick around that long, so he got into management, and he became the president and chief operating officer of United Space Alliance uh, from 1996 to his retirement in 2007. And United Space Alliance, many of you worked for, for them, including Marty as a contractor. Uh, they managed the space shuttle operations at Kennedy Space Center for about 12 years. And one of McCulley's uh, 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 awards that uh, he probably wouldn't want to be talked about much is he was the Child Advocate of the Year Award winner for the state of Florida from the Children's Home Society, an organization dedicated to services for children and young ma ma mothers. So uh, God bless you, Mike McCulley, for all you do. Just another astronaut in our community that's doing great things uh, for the people in our community. Uh, Mike and his wife of a long, long time, Jane, live on the Space Coast. They got a, a bunch of kids and a, a, a big corral of grandkids. and and But they love their fur babies and they love traveling in an RV around the country during the summertime. So, uh, Mike, hope to see you soon. And thanks for all that you do for the American Space Museum and uh, the kind things you do for uh, people out there. Uh, Marty, uh, give us a list of some of the people watching today. No, go ahead. Reread them off there, if you would. While I, while I show a picture here bragging on your photography work here, there's Marty's uh, uh, neighborhood there, the full moon rising, and that was the uh, that the uh, Atlas rocket launch or the SpaceX launch a couple weeks ago. That was SpaceX. That was a communication. I think it was SpaceX. It was a communication satellite. 
Uh, there's actually two satellites from north of Grumman. There you go. Yeah. Okay, who's watching uh, today? Yeah. Uh, Tom and Mark uh, Usiak, Doug Forrest, there Gary Jurell, Jordan, didn't get his last name, uh, Dave Stange, Steve Hammer, Kenneth Otto, Humberto Villada Lopez, William Whiting, Carlton Bailey, and Bernardo Martinez Ortega. Well, thank you all for staying curious with us today. And uh, uh, we'd love to get some of you down here on the Space Coast. Marty, got any for sale signs in that neighborhood of yours there? We're looking at behind me here. No? No. Okay. That's what I know of. All right. We're trying to get the UCX down here, at least one of them to plant down here. Because, uh, uh, but uh, we're rubbing it in a little bit there. But boy, the, you just. It's just amazing. Every every rocket launch can be different, particularly those twilight ones. You never know what you're going to get into. And there's just people. Uh, Marty's the only one in his whole neighborhood that even went out to look at it. That's how how uh, ho hum it is to people now on there. And uh, and a big shout out to you, Carlton Bailey, good friend. Glad to help you Sunday. Uh, certainly was fun to see uh, uh, Comic Con. Uh, those are fun events to go to support them we're going to have a space memorabilia show november 5th at the holiday inn and we'll start talking about that tomorrow and stay curious so uh marty thank you for another good program today i am eclipsing there the great goddard there i hate doing that to that wonderful man and uh, uh just go to bed thinking about your own dreams today and about this man in a cherry tree 10 years old in 1899 dreaming of going to the to the mars and then we could have been there by now uh a uh, hundred times probably uh if this great man was allowed to uh uh be embraced by society so marty thank you tomorrow we're going to talk more about the shuttles of the month of rocktober all here on stay curious i'm mark marquette and we can't wait to see you again to bridge the space between us.